Hi, everyone. This is Elizabeth Wilson. I'm a professor here at Dartmouth College and the director of the Irving Institute for Energy and Society. And this is part of the new energy series, Conversations with Early Career Energy Researchers. And this is the last talk in uh, this term session. And I'm so pleased to have Tony Reams from the University of Michigan, who will be speaking on an incandescent truth, spatial, racial, and socioeconomic disparities in residential energy efficiency. One of the reasons um, that I'm so happy to be part of this series is that it really has allowed us to have conversations with assistant professors, postdocs, and, and um, graduate students from across the United States, some from Europe as well. And as we move into next term, we really welcome um, young scholars in the conversations. And I have to say, after this term's um, set of speakers, I'm really enthusiastic about the future of this field and the important work that's happening here. So with that, I'd like to turn it to, to Tony Reams. His bio is on the website and he'll be speaking for 25 to 30 minutes and then we'll be in conversation together. So Tony, to you, thank you so much for being part of this series today. We're really looking forward to it. All right. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and to the Urban Institute for uh, this invitation. And thank all of you for um, attending today. Um, so as Elizabeth said, my talk is titled An Incandescent Truth, um, Spatial, Racial, Socioeconomic Disparities in Residential Energy Efficiency. So I want to start with this very normative question um, and this idea from where a lot of my work in this space begins. Um, is energy a basic human right? Um, we know that the United Nations and Sustainable Development Goal 7 has said that, you know, we will focus on bringing modern energy services to all. Um, but in constitutions like the United States and other places, um, energy is not codified in those documents as a basic right. Um, but if we think that energy is a basic right, the concept and the scholarship of energy justice um, tries to interrogate what that actually means and instances where that is not true. So uh, my research falls um, under this broad umbrella of energy justice. And in 2015, I launched the Urban Energy Justice uh, Lab, um, looking at research um, as our place for research for students and kind of the um, kind of frame the work I do at this intersection of energy and equity. Um, and we explore topics looking at distributional injustices, procedural injustices, and uh, recognition justice, um, particularly starting to go from identifying disparities to now looking at interventions to overcome disparities. So we all have this, you know, th this quote or this book or this article that really kind of pushed us in the direction of what we're interested in. Um, and one quote for me when I was doing this work back at University of Kansas and started looking at this topic of energy justice and energy and inequities um, was a report from 2004 from the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Um, and the beginning of the executive summary starts with this sentence, where US energy policy is concerned, African Americans are the proverbial canaries in the mine shaft. And so that really piqued my interest in understanding this interplay between um, race and place um, and socioeconomic status and energy um, and realizing that there was not really a lot of work in this space. Um, people explored it in the 70s during the energy crisis, but as we had more energy regulation, that interest in those intersectionalities began to wane. But we know that this is still a problem. And so I like to talk about the state of US energy and security, um, the Residential Energy Consumption Survey from uh, 2015 um, really explored this nationally and found that one in three households face some type of energy insecurity throughout the year, whether that was receiving a disconnect notice, keeping their home at an unhealthy temperature, either too hot or too cold, um, or the heat or eat challenge, you know, foregoing or reducing basic necessities just to be able to pay their energy bill. And this chart kind of shows, you know, how frequently people experience those energy insecurities, whether almost every month, some months, or one or two months throughout the year. And we know this is distributed differently across the country. Um, you can see 28% 20, of households in the Midwest experience energy insecurity, which is about 7.4 million households. Um, in the Northeast, we're looking at about 30% of households or 6.2 million. Um, 
but in the South, really having challenges with energy and security with 35% of households. And we know that the pandemic has exacerbated this challenge, right? Um, you know, we had the CARES Act, we had extended unemployment benefits, um, but even people who received the stimulus versus not received the stimulus um, experience energy and security very differently. Um, those who didn't receive the stimulus check um, when those were issued really experienced this. But then there were disparities across abilities, across having medical devices and across racial groups. And this is a study out of uh, Indiana University from May. But this issue of energy and race, again, really um, needs to be and continue to be interrogated so we can identify issues and create uh, positive solutions. And so let's take something as simple as energy consumption. Um, using the same data from the Residential Energy Consumption Survey, you can see that on average, white households consume um, more energy than the average household, which is that yellow line, um, but more energy um, than other racial or ethnic groups. And so inherently when programs target energy efficiency, uh, programs are incentivized mostly to target high consumers. And so inherently in that type of focus, uh, the outcome or the participation becomes skewed toward one racial group. And so white households are more likely to participate um, and be targeted for energy efficiency programs. But if we wanna normalize consumption, say across something like the size of the home, then what we see from a measure like energy use intensity is that black and Hispanic Latinx households actually consume more energy per square foot when compared to white and Asian households and more than the average US household. And so that's a measure of energy efficiency or a proxy for energy efficiency because you're consuming more energy to heat or cool or light the same amount of space as another home. And so if the focus is energy efficiency, then the target or an equity-based approach to energy efficiency would be the target inefficient housing, which would benefit uh, black and Hispanic households. And we see a similar phenomenon or a similar trend when we look at the cost of energy. If you consume more, you pay more nominally, but an equity-based approach would look at something like energy burden or the percentage of your income spent on energy costs. And so again, we see black and Hispanic households consuming more of their income or putting more of their income toward energy costs when compared to white and Asian households. And so this is a national um, analysis of this data, but what does this look like at the local level? <clears throat> so we've done two case studies um, in Detroit and in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, Kansas City, when I was working on my dissertation um, at University of Kansas, so I lived in Kansas City um, and started this work during the last economic recession and trying to understand the implementation of um, federal programs and federal dollars that were a part of the economic stimulus or the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And then just understanding the social and demographic um, challenges in Detroit made both of these two uh, good case studies to explore this. The studies both focus on heating efficiency. One, because a lot of the energy consumed in both Michigan and Missouri go to space um, heating or you know, cooling. Um, so a lot of the energy is being used to control the temperature in the home. And heating is, is definitely tied to the physical structure of the home, how um, well the home is insulated, how old are the windows, how many cracks are in the foundation and around the doors and windows. And so you can really tie the efficiency um, to the physical structure for heating. So really quickly for both of these studies, the, the big research question was, do heating consumption and efficiency differ across race, place, and class? Um, and I'll share these slides, but just um, a little bit of data on the methods and where the uh, data came from. And then just to show you briefly like what goes into this model. So um, a regression model and then doing some small area estimation, but looking at things that you can tie between the residential energy consumption survey and census data so you can explore this at some spatial scale. And so some of the independent variables are the type of house, whether it's a single family or multifamily, the age of the home, which we know is definitely connected to the type of energy efficiency measures in the house, 
um, the primary heating fuel source, um, and some other controls such as income, ownership, and number of rooms. <clears throat> so the first study I'll talk about really briefly um, was a study in Kansas City targeting energy justice um, across space, race, and socioeconomic class. And a, a really interesting phenomenon, again, that I don't think is interrogated enough when it comes to energy. Um, you see it in the housing consumption literature, but is this um, prevalence of residential income and racial segregation. Um, so many of our metropolitan areas are what we know as hyper segregated across race and income. And so this is a map of kind of three counties around the Kansas City um, area. And you can see on the left-hand side for income segregation, the yellow areas are really low income areas compared to the dark brown areas, which are high income. And you can see spatial concentration of low income areas, which map on pretty well to spatial concentrations of racial segregation. And so yellow areas in this map are where predominantly black households are, blue, um, Hispanic households, red, uh, white households. And just because Kansas City is one of these interesting cases, and I spent a lot of time there, um, <clears throat> just to show you this at a smaller scale, uh, this is Troost Avenue, which is the, the longest north-south street in, in Kansas City. And it actually is, you know, when people talk about the other side of the track or, you know, what separates people, um, it is definitely a dividing line between income, between race, um, city council districts, school attendance zones. Um, and you can see on the left hand side, red dots for white households and kind of that teal color for uh, black households. And so trying to figure out how this plays into housing consumption and then into energy efficiency. Pictures of houses on the west side of Troost and the east side of Troost, very similar. But if you look closer, you see newer siding on the west side of Troost where you have more white, higher income households. You see more plate glass windows, single pane windows, um, older wood siding on the east side of Truce where you have mostly African-American and lower income households. And so what did this end up looking like when we ran our model? We saw that you know, this was the distribution on the left-hand side of areas with high energy use intensity. So the redder the area, the less uh, energy efficient those housing um, units were in that census block group. And we can see the correlation with various um, socioeconomic and demographic characteristics. So as um, household income went up, the correlation between uh, energy efficiency was negative. And so houses with higher income were more energy efficient. Um, in areas with higher poverty, they were less efficient. Same thing with education, same thing with you know, senior households. And so elderly households are more vulnerable to live in energy efficient housing. And then you can see some racial demographics where you had more white households, the energy use intensity was lower compared to African-American, Hispanic households. And then this split incentive issue with renter occupied households um, are more likely to live in less efficient housing. And so then our study in Detroit, um, we wanted to see if the results would be replicated or if there were differences when we explored this model in a different city. <clears throat> so we see some similarities when it comes to residential segregation. And uh, this is Wayne County, which is the county where Detroit is located. Um, lower income block groups are concentrated within the purple boundary of the Detroit city limits, which map on really well to kind of the racial segregation um, with more African-American households in Detroit, a small enclave of Hispanic households um, kind of in the Southwest part of Detroit surrounded by larger communities of white households. And so when we map our consumption versus efficiency, we see again, you know, kind of a wide distribution of high consumption, the red areas, um, often larger houses, um, higher income folks, um, or just, you know, bigger, older houses. But when we normalize by the size of a home, we see a contraction of red areas that are mostly located within the city of Detroit, where you find your least energy um, efficient homes. And so when we compare consumption versus inefficiency across those same socioeconomic and demographic characteristics, 
you know, we see kind of how they are in opposite of each other, right? So as high as incomes become higher in a block group, the consumption level actually goes up, but the inefficiency goes down. So although they're consuming more energy in those block groups, their homes are a lot more efficient. And we see the same thing when it comes to poverty and household income, opposing arrows. But interestingly, in the Detroit area, there was no statistically significant difference in consumption across race. Now, remember, I showed you the national data that there were differences in consumption, uh, but that doesn't show up in this local space here in Detroit. Um, but you did see the difference when it came to the inefficiency of the homes. And then the same thing for housing tenure. You see much more consumption in owner-occupied housing, but um, much more efficiency as well. So really quickly, um, kind of uh, the namesake for this talk, um, <clears throat> I was riding in the car listening to NPR and there was a story talking about um, CVS. Hopefully nobody works for CVS on the call, um, but CVS was charging more for the same drug um, in different stores based on the zip code. And what the reporter found was that zip codes that were in poor neighborhoods, people were paying more for a drug than they were in um, a CVS in a more affluent neighborhood. And so I was interested in, you know, when people talk about differences in efficiency, like, oh, why don't they just buy more efficient appliances? Or why don't they just buy LED bulbs? Um, and so I really wanted to explore this um, from a cost perspective, but also an access perspective. And again, this was inspired by a lot of the food justice studies that find that healthier foods are more expensive in poor communities are less available. And so we divided the county around Detroit um, into kind of four or five um, poverty groups. So it's less than 10% poverty up to greater than 40% poverty. And we did a field study in about 130 stores um, across categories of stores and across the county. And this is based on the fact that we assume that people will buy something as simple as a light bulb in their local community or at the store closest to them. Um, and so we know that in urban areas there um, is underinvestment in big box stores and you know, poor neighborhoods and the urban core. And so um, we also know that there's a lack of personal access to vehicles um, in a lot of urban areas and a lot of urban areas don't have really good public transportation. So again, we said, oh, well, people might go to their local store to buy an LED bulb. So although there's a growth in adoption of LED bulbs, we still know that only about 30% of households have at least one bulb. This was about five years ago. Uh, we know the current administration vowed to make sure that we could still have access to incandescent bulbs. And so the options are still available to buy incandescent bulbs, although we were hoping that they would go away. Um, and so again, this study is very relevant to what people are actually facing when they go to stores. So a couple uh, charts for results here uh, really quick. We um, found that you know all stores carried still carried incandescent bulbs. The majority of stores did that kind of uh, gold color. The blue color, you can see that in um, areas with less poverty, uh, CFLs were not as prevalent. Um, CFLs, you know, consumers don't really like CFLs anyway. Um, but then the interesting thing is looking at the LED bulbs on the right hand side, that kind of teal color. So in the low poverty areas, about 91% of the stores we surveyed um, had LED bulbs, but in the poor areas, just over half of the stores had LED bulbs. And then when we looked at the price, there's a major difference in the pricing of those bulbs across um, different poverty groups. So stores in less than 10% poverty, a bulb was about 520 compared to about $8 in the poorest areas. Um, and then if you can see, there's a slight decline in the incandescent bulbs, which is that teal color. And what that does is make the price to transition from an incandescent bulb or upgrade to an LED bulb, you know, twice that in a poor area that it was in um, a lower poverty area. And so if you're low income and faced with, you know, the, these two price shocks, you're definitely going to go for the least expensive option, which in this case is the least efficient. 
Other things were, you know, what type of stores you have access to. You go into a big box store, you see huge displays. Someone's probably going to come up and help you find the right bulb. But in, you know, smaller stores and uh, poor communities, you may have a full shelf if it's a grocery store, all the way to like one shelf with bulbs if it's like a small hardware or um, convenience store. And so, you know, a lot of focus on our public programs on low income pro um, households. And then for folks who aren't low income, the thought is that you, you know, you can get credit and do what you need to do. But this study that we did in Michigan wanted to say, well, there's some people in the middle and we don't know who they are. And we don't know how many of those people exist. And so we call this the energy efficiency donut hole. They make just too much to qualify for government programs, but they don't have the credit worthiness or income to do it on their own. And so I wanted to show this because this is one of the kind of research and action um, pieces that you know allowed us to help uh, our green bank in Michigan kind of advocate for some type of alternative program for folks in the donut hole. And what we found was that in Michigan, one in eight households, or about 460,000 households, met the criteria to fall into this gap. And so we took data from the Green Bank's um, energy loan program to model who got approved. We knew how many 200% or below poverty households were in each county. And we were able to look at the spatial distribution of that. On the left, the number of households in each county that fall in the gap. And then on the right, um, the percentage of households that fall in the gap. And so most of the counties had anywhere between five and 15% of households in their county in that gap. The governor um, put in her budget uh, some funding for uh, the donut hole. Unfortunately, that was not passed by the legislator, but the Green Bank was able to work with um, the utility company uh, a couple energy services companies and some other nonprofits to actually create a program um, or a pilot program for folks in that gap. And so people can apply to get up to $7,500, excuse me, in um, energy efficiency improvements at a 0% interest rate um, that they can pay through the Green Bank. Um, Another thing I wanted to highlight is, you know, moving us toward the understanding of what are the metrics to begin to explore how we're doing on energy efficiency equity. And so um, I wanted to just put this out there, a tool that we created um, comparing a number of utilities across the country um, on this measure we're calling the energy efficiency equity baseline. And the idea is we know how much utilities are spending on their state required energy efficiency portfolio for states that require a proportion go to low income households. We know what the population is in those states and we know how much they're spending on their low income programs as a proportion of their total investment portfolio. And so what we created was a tool that you can go look at your local utility, um, find out what that investment should be and then we rank the utilities on how well they're doing to meet at least that, that floor. Uh, we don't want it to be a ceiling because we would love to see more investment in low income energy efficiency, uh, but at least we can call out utilities that are not at least putting an equitable proportion of their investment toward low income households. And then finally, um, again, to expand that much broader, um, along with several partners and um, funding from the Energy Foundation and Joyce Foundation. And next year, we're gonna launch a, a national framework to actually create um, a set of energy efficiency equity metrics to pilot it with people that are operating programs, make it flexible enough for governments and utilities um, and nonprofits that are getting funding to do energy efficiency and really begin to set a baseline for where we are as a country moving towards energy efficiency equity and hopefully be able to track that every year with organizations reporting how they're doing on this um, set of metrics that we collaboratively, collaboratively work on um, and, and iterate on over time. And so continue to push us toward this idea um, of 
greater energy justice, starting with the energy efficiency uh, field. And so that is all I have um, for you all today. I know that was a lot, but um, just wanted to kind of put out the trajectory of, of the work that, that I'm very passionate about going from demonstrating disparities to beginning to look at interventions to um, address these disparities. So thank you again, Elizabeth and the Urban Institute. And I look forward to Q&A. This is fantastic. We have about 25 minutes for Q&A, so we should be able to have a great discussion. Um, for the audience, please type your questions in the Q&A box and I'll be happy to take them. Um, but I'll start, we've got one there now, but Tony, I'm really, thank you very much for a wonderful talk and really one that pushed me to think a little bit more systematically about these issues. One of the things you haven't addressed in the talk is the issue of renters and the mm -hmm. kind of split incentive. And I would just love to hear a little bit of your thinking about that, or maybe even just explaining it to people what the issue is, and then how you think about this important population. Yeah, thank you for that, Elizabeth. So if you remember on the on both the Kansas City and Detroit studies, um, renters had, um, or areas that had more renter occupied households had higher energy use intensity. So again, they're more likely to be less efficient um, and one of the challenges is a, a very common principal agent um, issue known as um, split incentive. Um, 80 to 90 percent of renters pay their own utility bills. Um, and so there's no incentive for landlords to make homes more efficient. Um, I know there are people on the talk from uh, town and gown communities. So communities with a lot of colleges and a lot of renter occupied households. Those landlords have no incentive at all. Um, off-campus housing is probably some of the worst housing um, in America, <laughs> but they have no incentive because yeah. each year they're going to get a new um, cadre of students moving in. And so renters are very vulnerable to living in the least efficient housing, having the least efficient appliances, um, and having high energy burdens. And so if you look at ACEEE's energy burden report, you see that renters have high energy burdens. Um, one thing that was really exciting during the economic stimulus, the R era, um, is that <clears throat> many of the agencies that got this infusion of cash for the weatherization mm -hmm. assistance program actually targeted landlords because that was a huge market and they had to spend the money real fast. And so I'm hoping if we have another opportunity to you know, get a windfall of cash for energy efficiency, that landlords and renters are definitely a focus mm -hmm. uh, of those resources. Do you have any insights into the racial makeup or any of the economic inequity issues in that population at all? Yeah, um, so I'll give one example from Kansas City um, when they did this project called the Green Impact Zone. Um, so the, the, the goal was to target 150 block community mm -hmm. uh, with energy efficiency, particularly from the weatherization government funding. But they noticed that you know over 50% of the units a majority African American community was renter occupied. Right, right. Um, they did some, you know, social marketing to landlords. They did videos with landlords and tenants talking about how it benefit both of them to participate in energy efficiency. And so I think, you know, because a lot of people are concerned if they raise an issue with their landlord that there could be retribution, they could be put out. Right. Or if they make some improvements, that their rent is going to go up. And so trying to work through those issues is really important. No, those are those are really good points and good. The questions are coming in. Keep them coming in, everybody. Um, if you stop sharing your screen, we'll be bigger on the screen for everybody. Um, and one of the first questions is Claire McKenna. How do you reconcile the value of backward looking data sets like Rex with the understanding that energy costs and heating fuels will be changing as part of the clean energy all electric transition? And this is a super question because thinking about how our future systems need to change mm -hmm. and yet the real difficulty so many people have even paying for the existing system is, is one. So thanks for bringing that up, Claire, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for that question, Claire. Good to, uh, to read you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, you know, that is a challenge, right? Data is a major challenge with, with these issues. I was just teaching this morning about doing social life cycle assessment. And one of the issues with that type of approach is data, right? You don't have a lot of the data. Um, I, I think uh, uh, energy justice approach or equity approach, um, particularly to some of these electrification policies that local governments are passing um, is definitely really important. 
um, to ensure that there is actual transition mm -hmm. for vulnerable households. Um, I think one thing that the pandemic has created is that uh, a lot of public service utility commissions and regulatory bodies are requiring utilities to report some like very uh, concurrent data mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the challenges that households are facing. Um, and so I do think coming out of this, I, I feel like there will be a lot more data requirements that are more real time that we can begin to do some, some more frequent analysis. And then even some projective modeling, looking at some of those trends and how those burdens could shift, you know, with just different kind of if then assumption sets. Mm -hmm. I think you're right, having better data for that basic analysis would be super. Mm -hmm. um, next question, uh, Jesse Jenkins. The lack of access to capital for things like LEDs and other efficiency measures in low income communities is also highly relevant to adoption of heat pumps for decarbonizing building heat, space and water. Thoughts on your work can inform policy and design to ensure equitable, thoughts on how your work can ensure, um, inform policy design to ensure equitable adoption of energy efficient heat pumps over the decades. And this is the, the piece that I want you to take to heart. Also great work on this, really important to drive policy conversation. Yeah. Thanks, hey, Jesse. All right. Nice. Good, to, good to read you too. Um, yeah, you know, so we have a decarbonization uh, funding effort at University of Michigan that like everybody and their grandma is applying for. But, <laughs> but one of the big things we're thinking about um, is the adoption of um, heat pumps, um, particularly the challenge in a cold place like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And then how do we ensure that um, adoption of new technologies are don't follow the same trend of kind of our past energy efficiency, energy conservation efforts. Because if you look at, you know, decisions in the 80s to wrap a lot of the incentives for programs into the tax code, mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. immediately you take, you disadvantage low income households. Right, right, so right, right. Continue to do those types of things, I think. Um, and then, you know, I know weatherization and LIHEAP those resources are very strapped, right? We don't have right. enough money to even serve the houses that need it, but can we be more creative um, and in the way we implement those programs to include things like newer technology um, and a holistic approach to housing affordability or energy affordability? Now these are these are really interesting ways of thinking about that. And would these policies be at the state level? Are there any federal level policies? Where do you see the the kind of decision nexus? Municipalities? Yeah, um, I think all I think all of the above, right? Um, so for the big federal programs, we definitely need more flexibility in just way in the way the regulations regulations mm -hmm. are written, um, and then allowing you know for some case by case. Uh, implementation at the state mm -hmm. level where where they know a lot better of, of what's needed. Um, and, and again, I always go back to R because, you know, we saw that because the goal was to spend the cash. Yep. cash yep. So people could do some really creative things. But right after that was over, we went back <laughs> to the way we used to do it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, and, and you had so many people trained up for those weatherization programs, yeah. how to do it. And then when that money dried up, yeah, so did the jobs. Yeah. So did the jobs. So did the jobs. Um, question from Sue Kaplan. If you're ranking states on whether they're budgeting the energy efficiency funds for the donut hole low income demographics at the same percentage of the demographic itself, have you thought about making this one of the criteria for the ACEEE ranking of energy efficient states? That's the American Council for the Energy Efficient and Energy Efficient Economy. And they have a state ranking that they put out every year. That's a really great question, Sue. And um, we have not had that type of discussion, but I do think starting to combine some of these metrics, and I know they're going to engage with us on the equity metrics framework. And so, um, you know, I had a conversation with some folks at EPA kind of about that same thing. Like we have these data sets, how do we begin to start merging? these for a more holistic picture of kind of our, our energy environment. Um, one of the pieces that I've appreciated in this conversation is years ago with um, colleagues at University of Minnesota, we were looking at energy efficiency programs and rural electric cooperatives, and they really parallel quite similarly the programs that you've been talking about and that you have populations that are relatively poor with little cash to invest in energy efficient kind of improvements in their households. And I'm just wondering if you've thought at all about how you would need to structure your programs differently given that access to capital. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I always, um, so I call my lab the Urban Energy Justice Lab. And yeah. Because there's a lot more data for urban areas. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, but, but the like, problems are the same, right? You have exactly. people without the resources that live in very energy inefficient homes. Mm-hmm. With, and they buy a refrigerator when the refrigerator breaks, exactly. not because they remodeled their kitchen. Yeah, I grew up in South Carolina, um, rural community and in a rural co-op. And, you know, even getting my parents involved in voting for their, you know, co-op reps. Um, so this idea of democratizing energy, but yeah. you still have people that aren't engaged in that process. Um, and you can even look at the websites of some co-ops and see that they're not pushing energy efficiency. They're not talking about, you know, replacing light bulbs and things. And so, um, so yeah, looking at those challenges from both the urban and rural perspective, I think it's important. And I guess where some of the similarities are for thinking about program creation, I think would be a really interesting, ex- friendly amendment to, to the conversation and sometimes, that you know, crosses the country. Like municipal utilities are a lot yep. more vulnerable to you know, doing things like on bill financing and being more flexible. Yeah. In, um, the requirements for participating in programs and some of our investor owned utilities. No, I, I appreciate those different kind of t- kind of environments and topologies for different policies. That's an important thing to consider. Beth Polly asks, some mm-hmm. folks consider energy efficiency programs as being inherently equitable, but to your point, these policies can exacerbate inequities. How can energy advocates ensure energy efficiency policies are equitable during the policy development process? Yeah, thank you. Hey, Beth. Um, it's really, you know, I, so I spent some time reading um, case arguments at the uh, Public Service Commission, which are really can be really interesting, right? They can be. They can be. They can also help to cure insomnia. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's um, a nine billion dollar market they haven't tapped. <laughs> anyway, uh, please, sorry. But you can see how some utilities and you know, folks in the energy industry may have kind of co-opted this equity argument, right? Um, and so I, I remember the one of the first ones I read was about um, trying to create these energy efficiency resource standards in different states. And utilities definitely use the equity argument saying, if you force us to do energy efficiency, it's going to be inequitable because mm-hmm. only people that have you know income and knowledge yep. will participate in programs. Never did they say, so we need to make sure that we create incentives or we create offsets um, mm-hmm. or carve mm-hmm. outs for low-income households. Um, and so I do think part of the advocacy is, you know, for advocates to take that equity narrative back and propose solutions to ensure that program development and program implementation are equitable. Um, so one big win that some advocates had on the uh, east side of Missouri and Ameren, Missouri's territory, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is that the utility will report um, participation at the zip code plus four level for their energy efficiency programs. And so what that will allow is to do some analysis to see if there are gaps in communities that aren't being served, to see if there's over participation in mm-hmm. other communities. Mm-hmm. So now you can say, well, where do we need to target participation in this program because now we know where uptake is or isn't happening. Well, I think this is a really important point and one that ties into the earlier question. And utilities have used that same argument pretty much for every innovation, right? Of it's not going to be fair for people who can't pay for it. And if you think about even the traditional role of the consumer advocate, it's been about keeping prices low. And your point is that it's not about just low prices, it's really a story of energy burden, and that's what we should be working for. And that's a much more interesting conversation, I think, from a policy perspective, and one that does address some of these systematic injustices kind of baked into our urban infrastructures and our rural infrastructures. So I think this is a really smart but subtle point. And and if we had even our consumer advocates thinking not only of cents per kilowatt hour, but percent of income spent on energy and who, then we would be in a really interesting way to rethink some of these equity stories within our public utility conversations within our our, our pieces here. Um, Lin Zheng has a question for you. 
are there any macro level explanations that why white households generally use more energy than other races? The 2015 Rex chart, but better energy efficiency, less presumption per square foot. Would that might because white households generally have larger homes? Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, and so <clears throat> I think you hit on a really good point, right? And so consumption is definitely tied to the size of home. There's also some kind of geographic characteristics that play into the, the higher consumption of white households. Mm -hmm. so, um, so when you do something like energy efficiency, that's where you're able to control for the size of the home. Um, and in models that, that put square foot um, and other factors as control variables, you still see these kind of racial disparities um, in consumption. And so, um, so it's not anything, it's not that people actually use energy differently. It is, you know, these other characteristics about the, the housing, the appliances. Mm -hmm. And now uh, we could get into some, I'm sure there's some um, social psychology or some behavioral uh, factors that come into curtailment, you know, behaviors or. Um, well, your, your first chart on how people are, are, are sacrificing thermal yes. comfort and well-being. And we just had uh, Diana Hernandez's talk a few weeks ago where she was showing in the South Bronx, what was it, 13% of people heating with their stoves? So this idea of, of how people are actually living and what that means for indoor air quality, what that means for health and comfort, that data is there. So this is an interesting consideration that I think you've drawn out really well for us here. Yeah, we have a winter study that we're doing um, here in Michigan, focused particularly on elderly households, um, mm -hmm. temperature monitoring, indoor, outdoor, and some other air quality uh, monitors for households that particularly participate in the low-income home energy assistance program. So we know these are people who have um, energy poverty challenges. And so trying to make that connection, and Diana's uh, helping with that study too, to understand you know, what are the trade-offs people are making? Are they, are they making unhealthy choices because they're struggling to pay their utility bills? Right, right. Um, Hunter Snyder uh, asks, uh, what is the supply side management analog to the demand side management focus of your work? Are there efforts on the policy and governance side to implement clean energy, clean cheap energy firstly into areas where DSM techniques are more difficult to roll out? Is there a growing focus on equity in energy infrastructure? Can the donut be filled in a way by prioritizing low cost, cleaner infrastructure in these localities? Slashing energy demand is still very important and goes hand in hand with the supply side. Mm -hmm. yeah. A jelly donut. I know. <laughs> um, really great question, uh, Hunter. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I think there, you know, there are models. So if you look at the group um, Clean Energy States Alliance, um, you know, they have a lot of case studies and reports of state energy offices that have really taken this issue of uh, energy equity, energy access and affordability and put forth um, some pilots that, that address just the question you're talking about. Like, how do we uh, get low income households, say, signed up in community solar subscriptions? Can there be some flexibility in the utility bill assistance program that instead of just sending that money directly to the utility, that that money is used to offset the cost of a um, community solar subscription? Mm -hmm. um, and so Michigan Energy um, Office is on their third pilot now. The first one they did with a co-op. The second one was with a municipal utility. And now the, this next one is with an investor-owned utility. And so... <clears throat> It's all about collaboration. So at the table, you have the state government, mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. the utility, you have the health and human services who operates the energy assistance programs, um, and then you have a solar developer. And so, um, and so getting some low income households enrolled and doing weather weatherization and yep, yep, yep. Um, yeah, eat your tofu first, right? Like the weatherization <laughs> is so critical in this story and everyone wants the shiny solar panels and unless our spaces are, are working well also, but that's a really great piece and these different conversations that, that have to come together. You, you just outlined actors who normally don't necessarily talk they to each don't. other. They don't. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, even even getting those people around the table is so critical here. Um, next question is from the Dean of the Thayer School of Engineering here at Dartmouth, Alexis Abrahamson. Great talk, such an important topic. I work in this area, building energy efficiency, and there is such a need to address these overlapping issues. I wonder if you might talk a bit more about the role of technology engineers might play in addressing the human-centered challenges you presented today. Great question, great question, Alexis, thank you. Um, I, I am a former engineer, not a building engineer, I'm a former civil engineer. Um, but I also think about this idea um, from an engineering infrastructure perspective, right? And so, um, so, so thinking about how we are strategic um, in the rollout of energy efficiency or clean energy infrastructure projects. Um, you know, I teach a class on, on green buildings. Um, and when we think about that, we're always thinking about new construction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have such an opportunity here with our existing building infrastructure that, I mean, people could have jobs for, you know, decades if we, um, so I don't know if, if, most people probably didn't experience this, but um, there was a rollout by Google um, for their fiber, Google Fiber, high speed internet. And they were so strategic in the way they did it. They, they took a community-based approach. And so in your community, you had to get, you know, some, you had to reach some threshold of households signed up, one before they were building infrastructure. And then if you did that, they did free internet at your local library or school in your community. Um, and so I think that same way about energy efficiency, energy retrofits, um, we know, you know, the we know the building code that houses were built under based on the age of the house. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we'd be more strategic in trying to understand the mobilization of energy efficiency retrofits at a geographic scale. And so community A, all the houses were built in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. standard were they built by and what do we need to bring that house up to today's code? And so can we be kind of strategic in that rollout of energy retrofits for our existing buildings and then if we do new buildings, we think about the potential user of that new building um, a little more strategically, um, thinking about energy burden, thinking about comfort um, and that stuff. This actually goes right into the next question. Um, Thomas Breyer asks if um, uh, any data on energy efficiency of public housing units and structures. Um, un unrelated, can we overlay United Way 211 service assistance request data by zip code with energy efficiency data? What's the cost imposed on social service assistance organizations driven by energy inefficient residences? Yeah, great, great question, Thomas. And I think um, if you look, a lot of states and advocates are thinking about, um, especially as we, you know, so one of the arguments for not doing low income energy efficiency is that. Mm -hmm. The way a lot of the policies have been written is that the goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, reduce kilowatt hours. Yeah, by yeah. Capacity. I should do that. Low income households, you know, racial minority households consume less energy. So sometimes there's a there's less of a kilowatt hour savings potential that exists for these households, and mm -hmm. the major benefit mm -hmm. might be in the affordability. Um, but can we begin to look at some of these non energy benefits? Um, you know, can we offset the cost of emergency room visits? Can we improve indoor air quality? Um, and so I know some folks from Oak Ridge uh, that started um, 3 e cubed um, are starting to look at some of those non-energy benefits and folks at Slipstream. And um, so a lot of folks are starting to say like, well, how can we calculate to make sure the benefit cost uh, ratio is still greater than one? <laughs> and so that way, uh, and that's another way to bring in additional funding, right? Right, right. Because we aren't considering the healthcare costs of people yeah. living with asthma, people having exacerbated health conditions, and mm -hmm. and um, yeah. If you can reduce the cost of um, SNAP or food stamps, because now people have more money to buy food because they're not spending it on paying a utility bill or choosing between the two. And so, um, so I do. I think there's a great opportunity for some you know, really smart minds to think about. Um, you know, how we look strategically and holistically at the cost of assistance to improve. Yep, yep. Well, and, and back to the earlier conversation we had a little bit about, you know, how you roll out programs. I remember years ago, it might have been Spokane, but it was one of the municipal utilities who, as you mentioned before, oftentimes the most innovative. 
They looked at old housing. They looked at who hadn't pulled a furnace permit in 30 years. And then they targeted those communities. And if you overlay that with a map of the city to make sure you're equitably targeting these different zip codes, you'd be getting at some of the oldest energy users and you know, kind of maybe wrapping those services differently. Mm -hmm. And so there's ways that municipal utilities have access to these data that I think are really smart. One of the challenges that, um, you know, the smart meter was supposed to be this great, you know, be all end all that tells us about this, but then uh, especially the investor owned utilities often argue privacy mm -hmm. and that you can't share these data to make these policy decisions because of privacy concerns. And I'm wondering, you know, how you kind of balance these. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the privacy issues with energy use. We don't have it with water use, of course, that we can report and socially shame people for using too much water, but with energy um, and yet these really parallel and important equity needs for ensuring that these programs are actually getting effects that address these systematic injustices in our urban areas. Yeah, I think a really great example is the Illinois Commerce Commission. Um, and if you look at all utilities in Illinois have to report um, their smart meter data, yep. various, you know, protections for privacy, but you can look at it, you know, at zip code level, um, explore it at zip code level, or I think maybe even at census track or block. Hmm. And so the, a study from the Illinois Consumer Utility Board um, shows that, you know, low income households, if you look at um, their peak load, um, they kind of actually make the argument for kind of income-based uh, rates you know, and show less impact of low-income households or areas where you have majority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that, I mean, you're able to do those type of things with greater data availability. Um, and there are ways to roll in protections to, um, you know, ensure that if a zip code only has you know eight people in it, that maybe you just don't get the data for that zip code because you can easily identify the eight folks. I do think though these these tensions between privacy and kind of you know these are big public investments, mm -hmm. right? All of these programs and so the the considerations between privacy we we manage it with financial data, we manage it with education data, and I think that there isn't as much sophistication yet in the energy space. Uh, as we have seen in other sectors, but yeah. maybe that'll happen. But I, yeah. I promised that I would leave you with a, um, an opportunity to give us your big thoughts in terms of where you see this field going in the future and what you think are, are, are the most kind of important pressing things that you feel in your belly on this yeah. topic. So this yeah. has just been a fabulous conversation. I'm so thankful, but I wanna make sure you have the last word and then we'll be announcing the next events and wrapping up this term. So. Yeah. Right. You're it, man. Thank you for that, Elizabeth. Um, I think, you know, one of the major things that I like to say is uh, the data you don't have is the problem you don't see, right? <laughs> so I'm always pushing advocates to, you know, you know, comment on public service commission rate cases saying, like, give us more data. <laughs> and, you know, as I mean, as selfishly as a researcher, but I think that's the way, you know, we as researchers can help. Um, advocates feel their capacity as well if we get data and we can analyze it for them. Um, again, I think I'm very hopeful about 2021 and that we may have an opportunity to do something like we did um, in 2008, 2009 again, um, but we must do it with an eye toward justice mm -hmm. and equity and be strategic um, in how we implement any new funds that come into the energy space. Well, I just really want to thank you for today and um, for the audience and for you as well. I mean, that the speakers that you don't hear are those whose research you don't know about, a corollary to your data issue. <laughs> so please send names of people you want to see in this series. Um, Tony, the, the, the rest of the talks and yours as well are up on the website. And it's really an amazing series. I mean, learning about the research uh, that you're doing, that that um, the young assistant professors and postdocs and other colleagues are doing has just been fantastic. And um, for the next term in putting together the talks, I have really tried to focus a little bit on um, getting us uh, out of our homes. And I, I've tried to make the talks a little bit more internationally focused. Um, and so the first one will be kicking off in um, um, on conversations with uh, Deborah Seligson, 
who's a reframing US-China climate relations. Competition is key to climate mitigation. And Deborah is an assistant professor, but she is somebody who um, um, has had a, a professional career before entering the academy. So I think we'll all benefit from her 30 years working at the State Department in China, in India, um, and now then doing her PhD and, and now working in the academy. So as an assistant professor, her perspective is a little bit different than many of us. And, and I, my hope is that you'll enjoy this series, but the rest of the series and the events are, are, are on the website and we'll be sharing more of those as well. And for um, Dartmouth students, anyone who wants to, um, we're having a Federal Energy Regulatory Commission boot camp, and you can visit our website uh, to register. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for being part of this first term of this new energy um, conversation. And Tony, super big thank you to you. It was great to learn about your research, great to learn about your talk, and um, we'll be seeing you soon. Everybody stay safe, um, stay well, and we'll do these events in person one day. But in the meantime, take care. Right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie, for all your help with the logistics, too. We always appreciate you. Okay, bye, everyone.